Now, brothers and sisters, across the generations from the prophet Joseph Smith to President Russell M. Nelson, the doctrinal purposes of temple ordinances and covenants have been taught extensively by church leaders. A rich reservoir of resources exists in print, audio, video, and other formats to help us learn about initiatory ordinances, endowments, marriages, and other sealing ordinances. Information also is available about following the Savior by receiving and honoring covenants to keep the law of obedience, the law of sacrifice, the law of the gospel, the law of chastity, and the law of consecration. All Church members should become with the excellent materials available at temples.churchofjesuschrist.org. The Church's Temple website states, During the endowment ordinance, you will be invited to make certain covenants with God. These covenants are Law of Obedience, which includes striving to keep God's commandments. Law of Sacrifice, which means doing all we can to support the Lord's work and repenting with a broken heart and contrite spirit. Law of the Gospel, which is the higher law that He taught while He was on the earth. Law of Chastity, which means that we have sexual relations only with the person to whom we are legally and lawfully wedded according to God's law. Law of Consecration, which means dedicating our time, talents, and everything with which the Lord has blessed us to building up Jesus Christ's Church on the earth. The For the Strength of Youth magazine states, The Law of Consecration is a principle the Lord gives to His covenant people. To live this principle, Men and women dedicate themselves completely to building up God's kingdom and ensuring that there are no poor among them. They give their time, talents, and material resources to serve the Lord, His Church, and His children. In the early days of the restored Church, the Lord instructed Joseph Smith on a particular way the saints were to live this law. The saints were to consecrate their property to the Church by giving it to the bishop. He would then give them back what they needed. The rest was used to help the poor. Today, we live this law in different ways. For instance, we serve others, accept callings and assignments in the church and do our best at them, and pay a full tithe and a generous fast offering. When we do what the prophets and the Holy Ghost direct us to do to build up God's kingdom and help the needy, we are living the law of consecration. In the temple, we are prepared and promised to live the law of consecration. Able young men begin to live this law by seeking a mission call. Our Heavenly Father hears the prayers of His children across the earth, pleading for food to eat, clothes to cover their bodies, and for the dignity that would come from being able to provide for themselves. Those pleas have reached Him since He placed men and women on the earth. You learn of those needs where you live and from across the world. Your heart is often stirred with feelings of sympathy. When you meet someone struggling to find employment, you feel that desire to help. You feel it when you go into the home of a widow and see that she has no food. You feel it when you see photographs of crying children sitting in the ruins of their home, destroyed by an earthquake or by fire. Because the Lord hears their cries and feels your deep compassion for them, He has from the beginning of time provided ways for His disciples to help. He has invited His children to consecrate their time, their means, and themselves to join with Him in serving others. His way of helping has at times been called living the law of consecration. In another period, His way was called the United Order. In our time, it is called the Church Welfare Program. 
the names and details of operation are changed to fit the needs and conditions of people, but always the Lord's way to help those in need in temporal need requires people who, out of love, have consecrated themselves and what they have to God and to His Word. He has invited and commanded us to participate in His work to lift up those in need. We have a covenant to do that in the waters of baptism and in the holy temples of God. We renew the covenant on Sundays when we partake of the sacrament. There are two unique times in our lives when we can truly live the law of consecration and devote ourselves in full-time support and service to the Lord. One is as a young man or woman serving a full-time mission. The other is the unique time you are given after having fulfilled the requirements of earning a living. The latter can be called the patriarchal years, when you can draw upon the rich experiences of a lifetime Go out as a couple and consecrate yourselves fully as servants of the Lord. The blessings of serving your eternal companion are priceless and can only be understood by those who have experienced it. My wife and I had the privilege in the mission field to be together. Each day is a special day with daily rewards that cause personal growth and development in the Lord's time and in the Lord's way. The fulfillment that comes from this kind of service will bless you, your marriage, and your family for eternity. Prepare yourself as missionaries. Going on a mission teaches you to live the law of consecration. It may be the only time in your life when you can give to the Lord all your time, talents, and resources. In return, the Lord will bless you and have His Spirit to be with you. He will be close to you and strengthen you. The payment of tithing also brings individual tithe payer unique spiritual blessings. Tithe paying is evidence that we accept the law of sacrifice. It also prepares us for the law of consecration and the other higher laws of the celestial kingdom. The lectures on faith prepared by the early leaders of the restored church part the curtain on that subject when they say, let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary to life and salvation. For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things." End of quote. This is a revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith regarding the law of consecration. And behold, thou wilt remember the poor and consecrate of thy properties for their support, that which, that which thou hast impart unto them, with a covenant and a deed which cannot be broken. And inasmuch as ye impart your substance unto the poor, ye will do it unto me, and they shall be laid before the bishop of my church and his counselors. Therefore the residue shall be kept in my storehouse to administer to the poor and the needy. The Lord restates this principle many times, including section 70 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 7. Nevertheless, inasmuch as they receive more than is needful for their necessities and their wants, it shall be given unto my storehouse. Further, you will recall, when a certain ruler asked Jesus what he should do to inherit eternal life, the Savior responded, Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Again from the Doctrine and Covenants we learn, For it is expedient that I, the Lord, should make every man accountable as a steward over earthly blessings which I have made and prepared for my creatures. 
I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine. But it must needs be done in mine own way. And behold, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for my saints, that the poor shall be exalted in that the rich are made low. For the earth is full, and there is enough to spare. Yea, I prepared all things, and have given unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves. Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion, according to the law of my gospel, and to the poor and the needy, he shall with the wicked lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment. Clearly we are preparing for the day when the higher law, that of consecration, will again become the financial law of the Church throughout which we will properly take care of the poor. Until that time, it is our responsibility and blessing, as a matter of fact, our covenant, to give generously from our surplus to bless the poor. I have learned from Joseph Fielding Smith and to talk to young people what the law of consecration is. It is not one particular event. It is a lifetime, day by day, each one of us striving to do our best that we might, as President Joseph Fielding Smith talked about, not as his grandfather Hiram Smith gave his life when he was a patriarch and with the prophet, but that we might in each day give our life to live an honorable life to do the best we can in the service of others. Becoming a people which is collectively pure in heart is not an impossible dream or an idealistic goal. We know this because the Lord has commanded us to become such, and the Lord gives no commandments that the to the children of uh, men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the things which he commanded them. When we reach the state of having the pure love of Christ, our desire to serve one another will have grown to the point where we will be living fully the law of consecration. Living the law of consecration exalts the poor and humbles the rich. In the process, both are sanctified. The poor, released from the bondage and humiliating limitations of poverty, are enabled as free men to rise to their full potential, both temporally and spiritually. The rich, by consecration and the imparting of their surplus for the benefit of the poor, not by constraint, but willingly, as an act of free will, evidence that charity for their fellow men characterized by Mormon as the pure love of Christ. This will bring both the giver and receiver to the common ground on which the Spirit of God can meet them. Tithing has special purpose as a preparatory law. Early in this dispensation, the Lord commanded certain members of the Church to live the higher law of consecration, a law received by covenant. When this covenant was not kept, great tribulations came upon the saints. The law of consecration was then withdrawn. In its place, the Lord revealed the law of tithing for the whole Church, and on July 8th of 1838, He declared, and this shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. Those who have thus been tithed shall pay one-tenth of all their interest annually, and this shall be a standing law unto them forever. The law of tithing prepares us to live the higher law of consecration, to dedicate and give all of our time, talents, and resources to the work of the Lord. Until the day when we are required to live this higher law, we are commanded to live the law of the tithe. 
we are not always called upon to live the whole law of consecration and give all of our time, talents, and means to the building up of the Lord's earthly kingdom. Few of us are called upon to sacrifice much of what we possess, and at the moment there is only an occasional martyr in the cause of revealed religion. But what the scriptural account means is that to gain celestial salvation, we must be able to live these laws to the full if we are called upon to do so. Implicit in this is the reality that we must in fact live them to the extent we are called upon so to do. How, for instance, can we establish our ability to live the full law of consecration if we do not pay an honest tithing? Or how can we prove our willingness to sacrifice all things if need be if we do not make the small sacrifices of time and toil or of money and means that we are now asked to make? Now I think it is perfectly clear that the Lord expects more of us than we sometimes render in response. We are not as other men. We are the saints of God and have the revelations of heaven. Where much is given, much is expected. We are to put first in our lives the things of his kingdom. We are commanded to live in harmony with the Lord's laws, to keep all his commandments, to sacrifice all things if need be for his name's sake, to conform to the terms and conditions of the law of consecration. We have made covenants so to do, solemn, sacred, holy covenants, pledging ourselves before gods and angels. We are under covenant to live the law of obedience. We are under covenant to live the law of sacrifice. We are under covenant to live the law of consecration. With this in mind, hear this word from the Lord. If you will that I give unto you a place in the celestial world, you must prepare yourselves by doing the things which I have commanded you and required of you. It is our privilege to consecrate our time talents and means to build up the kingdom. We are called upon to sacrifice in one degree or another for the furtherance of his work. Obedience is essential to salvation. So also is service. So also are consecration and sacrifice. It is our privilege to raise the warning voice to our neighbors and to go on missions and offer the truths of salvation to our father's other children everywhere. We can respond to calls to serve as bishops, as Relief Society presidents, as home teachers, and in any of hundreds of positions of responsibility in our various church organizations. We can labor on welfare projects, engage in genealogical research, perform vicarious ordinances in the temples. We can pay an honest tithing and contribute to our fast offering, welfare, budget, building, and missionary funds. We can bequeath portions of our assets and devise portions of our properties to the church when we pass on to other spheres. We can consecrate a portion of our time to systematic study, to becoming gospel scholars, to treasuring up the revealed truths which guide us in paths of truth and righteousness. And may I say also, both by way of doctrine and of testimony, that it is his voice which invites us to consecrate of our time, our talents, and our means to carry on his work. It is his voice that calls for service and sacrifice. This is his work. He is at the helm, guiding and directing the destiny of his kingdom. And every member of his church has this promise, that if he remains true and faithful, obeying, serving, consecrating, sacrificing, as required by the gospel, shall be repaid in eternity a thousandfold and shall have eternal life. Almost from the beginning of my services in church welfare, 
I have had the conviction that what we are really doing in this welfare work is preliminary to the establishment of the law of consecration and stewardship as required under the United Order. If we could always remember this goal toward which we are working, we would never lose our bearings in this great work. What we are about is not new. It is as old as the gospel itself. When, whenever the Lord has had a people who would accept and live the gospel, he has established the United Order. He established it among the people of Enoch, of whom the record says, The Lord blessed the land, and they were blessed upon the mountains, and upon the high places, and did flourish. And the Lord called his people Zion, because they are of one heart and one mind, and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. If we will do the things the Lord has asked us to do, we too will continue to be blessed, and we'll dwell in righteousness. In the revelation which the prophet called or said specified as embracing the law of the church, the Lord said, Behold, thou wilt remember the poor, and consecrate all thy properties to their support, which thou hast to impart unto them. And inasmuch as ye impart of your substance unto the poor, ye shall do it unto me, and they shall be laid before the bishop of my church and his counselors. And it shall come to pass that after they are laid before the bishop of my church, it shall be kept to administer to those who have not from time to time, that every man who has need may be amply supplied and receive according to his needs. Therefore, the residue shall be kept in my storehouse to administer to the poor and the needy. This I do, said the Lord, for the salvation of my people. In this revelation, which the prophet designated the law of the church, the Lord revealed the essentials of the United Order, his, which was his program for eliminating the inequalities among men. It is based upon the underlying concept that the earth and all things therein belong to the Lord, and that men hold earthly possessions as stewards accountable to the Lord. I, the Lord, he said, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, and all things therein are mine. And it's my purpose to provide for my saints, for all things are mine, but it must needs be done in mine own way. With these concepts in mind, we are better prepared to understand how our present welfare services efforts relate to the United Order and the full ideal of Zion, which the Lord has in mind to bring about. Because the people were not then fully ready to live the United Order, the Lord suspended it because, as he said, they have not learned to be obedient to the things which I required at their hands and are full of all manner of evil, and do not impart of their substance as become the saints to the poor and the afflicted among them, and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. And Zion cannot be built up 
unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise, I cannot receive her unto myself. He further indicated that, and I quote, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion, that they themselves may be prepared, and that my people may be taught more perfectly, and have experience, and know more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. Full implementation of the United Order must, according to that revelation, the 105th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, await the redemption of Zion. In the meantime, while we are being more perfectly taught and are gaining experience, we should be strictly living the principles of the United Order insofar as they are embodied in present church requirements such as tithing, fast offerings, welfare projects, storehouses, and other principles and practices. Through these programs, we should, as individuals, implement in our own lives the bases of the United Order. The law of tithing, for example, gives us a great opportunity to implement the principle of consecration and stewardships. It is thus apparent that when the principles of tithing and the fast are properly observed and the welfare plan gets fully developed and wholly into operation, we shall not be so very far from carrying out the great fundamentals of the United Order. The only limitations on you and me is within ourselves. And now in line with these remarks, for three things I pray. One, that the Lord will quicken our understanding of the covenant of consecration which we, which we who are endowed have all made. President Kimball, in a landmark article published in the June 1976 ensign has encouraged us to review what our righteous needs and desires are as compared to what our surplus of residue might be. And then I quote, many people spend most of their time working in the service of a self-image that includes sufficient money, stocks, bonds, investments, portfolios, property, and credit cards, furnishings, automobiles, and the like to guarantee their security through, it is hoped, a long and happy life. Forgotten is the fact that our assignment is to use these resources in our families and quorums to build up the kingdom of God to further the missionary effort and the genealogical and temple work, to raise our children up as fruitful servants unto the Lord, to bless others in every way, that we may also be fruitful instead of expend these blessings on our own desires. And as Moroni said, ye adorn yourselves with that which hath no lie, and yet suffer the hungry and the needy, and the naked, and the sick, and the afflicted to pass by you and notice them not. As the Lord himself said in our day, they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way, and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old, and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall. What we, that we will study the talk of, talks of this session carefully and implement according to the dictates of the Spirit 
such facets of the welfare effort, particularly the establishment of the Lord's storehouses, and third, that through faithful observance of the principles of tithing, the fast, and the welfare program, we will prepare ourselves to resume Zion and ultimately live the United Order is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.